what we saw was that in dim light conditions, remember these mice can see perfectly normally in, in bright light and normal light, but in dim light, the animals don't track their heads at all. They don't move in response. They can't see the grating. But in treated animals, we see that they, they, move, they, they track the grating, and we can actually measure their visual acuity and contrast sensitivity. It's not as good as normal animals, but um, it's a significant improvement, and it correlates with the number of transplanted cells. But ultimately, we want to test real vision, and, and the optokinetic response is just a reflex response. And the way we tested vision was to use a, a water maze. We can train the animals to, 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 to swim to a hidden platform in response to a visual cue. Mice don't like being in water, they want to get out. And these mice can see in normal light, so we can train them in normal light to identify the platform with a visual cue. And then we, then we put them at the, in the maze and we, we watch them make a decision to swim at either one or the other side of this divider. And um, what we found is that, that in treated animals, they could perform the task, some of them at least could, and, um, um, whereas untreated animals would just swim around in, in circles. And I want to just show you a video that you can, that sort of illustrates this. So this is, remember, this is in dim light conditions. It looks brighter than it is because we filmed under infrared. This is a normal mouse and it swims straight to the, to the side with a visual cue, which is this strike grating. And this is an impaired mouse, visually impaired mouse, it's a Gina 1 knockout mouse that's been, not been treated, and it will swim around in circles. It will eventually, it may eventually find the, the platform, but it's not doing it using a visual cue. It's made an in, incorrect decision, it's swum the wrong side of this, of this divider. Now this is a treated animal. It's a bit slower than a wild type animal, but it swims straight to the platform. And this is just an example. Um, in, the, in the paper itself, you can, you can see many more examples, but what we did is we ran many, many trials, and we have to, to, to average and analyze all these trials. And what we see when we run 30 trials or so over a number of days is that the untreated animals and the sham treated animals, which have received cells taken from another gene out one knockout mouse, they are only able to, to make that decision correctly 50% of the time, just by chance. What we're looking for is correct decisions um, above um, 70%. And we see that a number of the treated animals can do that. So start here, some of them are almost uh, 100%. And the animal you saw was this, this animal number one that could do it almost every time. What's most convincing is not only the, the, the number of times they made the correct decision, but how they did it. They swam straight to the target. And what's also reassuring is those mice could, that could perform the task had the highest number of integrated cells. They correlated. So we're very convinced that, that what we've shown for the first time is that we can transplant photoreceptor cells and, and, we, and improve vision. And this provides a real rationale for developing stem cell um, based approaches for, for the treatment of, of retinal dystrophies. So, what does it really mean, and how, how long might it be before we can translate this sort of finding? Well, um, we're, not, we're still not transplanting very many cells, um, we, but perhaps we only need 20,000 cells for improved scotopic vision. But just remember, in the, in the, in the, in the fovea, we only have 200,000 cones. In the foveoli, we only have 20,000 cones. If we can transplant a patch of cones, possibly we could have a major impact on vision and visual acuity. And that's really ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to develop the similar protocols for transplanting not rods, but cones. But there are a huge number of challenges. We, we need to, these are some of the challenges which is listed, we need to think about the immune response, we need to think about transplantation into, into multiple degeneration, in, in advanced degeneration. Uh, transplant cones, I've mentioned that. We have to still improve the efficiency of transplantation. The more cells we can transplant, the better the outcome. Um, we also really need to find ways of deriving photoreceptor precursors from stem cells. 
and that's the other aspect of, 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 of the programme. Um, before I move on, I just this is a very busy slide, which I'm not going to go. Just it's work that's um, just been submitted, and it's in, it, it, it's a it's a very extensive study in which we transplanted photoreceptors into many different models of, of retinal degeneration. So this is a study involving thousands of mice, and we tr we transplanted into into models of rapid degeneration, slow degeneration, and what we've seen is that we can transplant into into, into even the most severe models and still have incorporation and synaptic connection. We see differences. We see differences um, in the levels of integration depending on the time of degeneration and we start to establish some rules. And what we see is that, is that um, there are certain factors that influence the level of in integration. Um, for instance, the amount of gliosis um, the integrity of the outer limiting membrane. But we found ways of manipulating both of those and therefore increasing the efficiency of integration even in the most severe models. And that's, that's a study that um, we hope will be published quite soon. But I think, again, a major sort of step forward because we're seeing how to transplant into models of, of advanced degeneration. And I'll, I'll skip, skip those. One thing we're, we're trying to do is to, is, to, is to think ahead in terms of how we might translate. At the moment, all our, our strategies involve using marked cells that, that are marked with green fluorescent protein. We can't do that clinically. And so we started to identify cell surface markers that allow us to pick out cells that are at the right stage. And we found that we can use um, cell surface markers to transplant these photoreceptor cells. Um, and uh, actually it's more efficient than using, than using the green fluorescent protein. So that's a huge step forward too. Um, we, we've, although we want to transplant cones, this has been a real struggle for us in terms of efficiency. We've established the principles that when we transplant um, uh, photoreceptor cells, we do see the occasional cone. This we published uh, around a year ago. We do see the, um, the integration of, of cone photoreceptor cells, but it's really inefficient. And we now have a major program grant from the Medical Research Council that's devoted to increasing the efficiency of cone transplantation. And this is going to be one of the major, I believe, one of the major requirements for taking this therapy through to, to, to the clinic. So I'm gonna finish in, 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 in just three minutes with, um, uh, with, with the final aspect of, of um, the program, which is how to generate photoreceptor cells for transplantation from stem cells. And this has been a huge challenge, challenge, but again, in the last few years, there's been major progress. So uh, many groups have been working on the differentiation of stem cells into, um, in, uh, into photoreceptor cells. And, um, um, there were two seminal papers um, in 2006, 2008 from Tom Ray and Masao Takahashi that showed it is possible to differentiate embryonic stem cells into, into photoreceptor cells in vitro. Um, and these are very complicated protocols. We're using, we started off using a protocol developed by Masao Takahashi, published it in, a, in a very good journal, Nature Biotechnology. And we've been working with this protocol for, for many years. Um, one of my postdocs went to Japan and, and, and learned the technique from, uh, in her lab. And we've been optimizing this technique. And we've really characterized in some detail the, the sorts of photoreceptor cells we can generate from, from these in vitro cultures of stem cells. And you know, we're convinced that, that we're making genuine photoreceptor cells um, but we're not using this protocol. We can't generate enough photoreceptor cells at the right stage for transplantation. And we've just published a paper in, in stem cells showing um, uh, that, that it, is, it is not possible to, to transplant these cells effectively just because there are too few of them at the right stage. Last year, there was an amazing paper in, in Nature from one of uh, Masao Takahashi's colleagues in, in, in Japan, um, uh, Yoshiki Sasai, 
who published and he had a front cover of Nature showing that it's possible to generate whole new retinas in a dish from embryonic stem cells. And it was, I think, the most amazing paper that I've, I've, I've seen in my career. I, I mean, I was blown away by this. And um, what, what Sasa managed to do is to, is to develop a protocol in which ES cells um, grow as the so-called embryo bodies, and he could identify these out pouchings. These are optic uh, cups. And when you, when you take explant these optic cups, you have essentially a retina in a dish. And um, we, we're using this protocol now, and what we're seeing are these beautiful retinas in a dish, which essentially is like having a donor retina. Um, and we, we're now able to um, make cell suspensions from, from these retina and transplant them. That's um, a good warning. Um, but I'm almost finished. But the, the exciting punchline is that we're now able to generate sufficient cells for transplantation. And so we, we, we have um, cells at the right stage, which are these precursor cells, but they're derived from embryonic stem cells. So I think very soon we'll be able to demonstrate the sort of function that we've got from, um, from, from the donor retina from mice, but using um, uh, embryonic stem cell derived material. And I, that is, that is an, a really big breakthrough because that means we then have a suitable cell source for, for clinical application. So in conclusion, I think photoreceptor transplantation does offer a viable potential strategy for retinal repair. It's not, it's not going to be easy. I've shown you a lot of the problems associated with, with, with this sort of strategy. But there are ways to overcome each of these barriers. I, I believe that we're, we're showing that and groups, other groups around the world are working on, the, on, on, on different ways of overcoming the barriers. So I hope to have shown you that there's been huge progress over the last eight years or so. But in order to take it through to clinical application, what's clear is that is that we need an integration of, of lots of different types of science, from transplantation biology, visual neuroscience, stem cell biology, because, um, and we also need to understand the processes of retinal degeneration too. And it's only when we synthesize all of this can we take something as complicated as stem cell therapy all the way through to clinical application. So I, I must thank the, the, the cell transplantation group in my, in my department, um, particularly, uh, Rachel Pearson, who, who did most of the work for our latest paper in Nature, uh, and my long-term collaborator, uh, Jane Sowden, who's a developmental biologist I developed the stem cell work with. And um, thank you very much.